I'll start, yeah, I mean, awareness as a field. So there'll be two parts to the talk. So the first, um, I'll try to kind of discuss, so the second part is related to the first part, but the first part, you know, even if you're not interested in quantum at all or think it's completely crazy, the first part might st still interest you. So that's, uh, I'll try to kind of say why fields uh, might be um, important for what you might call mathematical phenomenology. Um, and in the second part, I'll try to give um, a quantum collapse model. that would use the, the first ID uh, as part of it. Um, so you might have heard me give talks in the past where I sort of try to explain why, if, why quantum is actually, I mean, this came up a lot during the day, but why quantum is, in, should be used, I think, for consciousness. At least uh, in the argument, I'll say it in kind of very few sentences, there's a, I think the biggest question, I think, for consciousness science is to figure out what consciousness does. Uh, I think you might have heard me say this before. We don't really know. And uh, so, the, you know, there were lots of kind of suggestions here about what consciousness might be, and there are kind of theories that try to define it. But if we want... <laughs> if we want a scientific theory of consciousness, we need consciousness to do something in, well, at least in the world. Um, it might not do anything, and it might be an epiphenomena, but if it is an epiphenomena, we can never have a science of it. We might have, we might guess correctly the theory of what consciousness is, but there'll never be a way of really checking if our theory is correct. And, and then, so that's kind of the first argument. If you want the science of consciousness and not philosophy of consciousness, we need to kind of find if consciousness does anything. Now, and the second point is if it does anything, so you can give kind of very general arguments that if uh, it does anything in the sense that kind of it changes what we know of physics, so it kind of it's really something new. I mean, it might be something that we just haven't noticed yet, and it's part of kind of current physics, but if it is something new in some sense, uh, which I think is very likely because we still haven't found something old that it does. I mean, a lot of neuroscience really can explain all of our behavior without mentioning the word consciousness. If it's something new, then actually it sort of forces it to be quantum in some sense. So if, I, I won't discuss this again, but if you want to discuss this later, I'm very happy to explain why I think that, that consciousness needs to probably be, be quantum in some ways, you'll see in what. But before, you know, just for part one, um, just about fields. So just why fields for modeling consciousness? Um, so there, I, well, I'll give you maybe a couple of reasons why this might be reasonable or a good way of modeling. So first one, which is kind of related to the second part, is just that this might turn out to be um, what is required from a scientific theory of consciousness. So, I mean, so this is kind of a bad, but kind of maybe because it works. <laughs> so that, you know, if, if kind of the, the type of models I'll present in the second part are correct, then feel, we'll just have fields in them. But uh, kind of, if you're not, you know, maybe another, Thing that might convince you as well is that it kind of might uh, be a good solution uh, to problems in phenomenology. Um, 
I hope I'm spelling it correctly. <laughs> so, so I'll start kind of um, with what do I mean by that. So the kind of reason too, what one of the things it can mean, sorry for my handwriting. So reason two is that, um, so how do we reconcile um, kind of the kind of the possibility of uh, experience being ineffable uh, with mathematical uh, modeling. I mean, these two things seem to contradict each other, right? If you can mathematically model uh, something, it's clearly not ineffable. So, of course, the question is, what do I mean by ineffable? And there are lots of ways of uh, thinking about this. But, um, so I'll try kind of to explain what ineffability might mean in a, in a way that is still compatible with mathematical modeling. So, so for that kind of, when we say something is ineffable, we usually, and, and let's say I take it very seriously that in some very fundamental way experience is ineffable. Um, but what this might mean is kind of the following. So ineffable is that kind of you cannot express it in language. And what do you mean by language? So kind of language, uh, and here kind of I, I mean both kind of natural language and also mathematical language. So I don't so here I disagree with uh, Penrose. I don't see these that somehow mathematics is out there and we're just trying to express it. I mean, you know, we're human, we're animals, we talk in certain ways. Some of our ways are very precise and follow kind of fixed rules and that's essentially what mathematics is. And I think what kind of like the revolutions in mathematics in the 20th century have shown us is that mathematics is definitely not kind of what historically we think of as mathematics. It's not number theory, geometry, algebra. Mathematics is anything you do in a precise way with rules that don't change over time. So then you have a community that agrees on what they do and they don't fight, well, they might fight on resources, but at least they don't fight if, about the meaning of their words. And that's really what I take mathematics to be. If you look at kind of what happened with mathematics, you know, what we call now geometry has nothing to do with what was called geometry, well, maybe something, but very little was, has been called geometry for thousands of years. Um, but so, uh, so it's not really so different, you know, the difference is more a matter of precision and fixed rules and, and so, but still, so I, it's language somehow. We can you know, discuss this for hours. But the point is that all human languages, and you know, maybe aliens have different languages, if they're fluid or something like that, they might have other languages than us, but language, human language is kind of discrete um, and kind of generated by a finite number of rules. So that's what we can say about human languages, or at least the languages we use most of the time. Um, so, so the so that's kind of the problem, that uh, language seems kind of, so we can describe uh, experience, uh, but not, not in a good enough way. And I think it comes from the, this limitations of human languages. Both mathematical. So, for instance, uh, if we try to be more precise and use mathematical languages, we'll have some form of what you might call kind of experience space. So, you know, there can be different suggestions and there can have been different models for, so it could be some metric spaces um, or maybe some manifolds, maybe with a Riemannian metric. Um, I mean, some type of kind of a geometric type of space that kind of you, 
again, what you mean by geometry is also can be quite broad, but something that would describe like points in this space might describe experience somehow. Um, and kind of, I think if you look at most models of this, either coming from like vision or what like IIT, Q shapes, things like that. So the models tend to be um, finite dimensional. So some kind of finite dimensional geometric objects. That's how people tend to model some types of experiences. Um, so by finite dimension, I just mean that kind of points on the space can be described by a finite number of, of kind of, let's say there's a finite amount of data describing this, these points, a finite number of coordinates. Of course, you might say coordinates themselves might need some kind of, an, you know, we discussed pi earlier this day, we might need kind of infinite uh, amount of data, but still you can give some names, uh, pi for instance. So, uh, so most points in the space that you kind of describe, or you can write it, uh, you know, as some regions in the space kind of, for instance, uh, I can use words like pi, I can use equations like x squared plus y squared equal one. So even though there are kind of some irrational or transcendental elements in the space, we can still kind of use uh, a finite language to describe quite a lot of this space. Uh, and I think this might seem incompatible with the fact that experience maybe cannot be described. I mean, again, I, I don't really have a visceral feeling of free will. Uh, maybe I have a visceral feeling more of uh, that I don't have free will, but, uh, but I do have a visceral feeling that uh, I cannot really, I can talk about my experience, but it's never really enough. It never really describes it as it is. So a way of modeling this is kind of a suggestion is to actually use kind of infinite dimensional uh, geometric objects as experience spaces. So the advantage of these is that um, it's, you know, again, you might say that in some sense they're still effable. I mean, you, you still describe them as some mathematical object. But in order to describe points in these kind of infinite dimensional manifolds, you need an infinite number of coordinates. So, it, so kind of human languages, find it will be harder for us. Some points can be described, but in general, it's harder to describe points in such spaces. Um, but, you know, so as an example, and this is kind of where fields, so fields come in, is some, some spaces of, let's say, you know, like C infinity, on R3, so by this I mean, or C infinity or C0, I mean, these will be functions from R3 to R, maybe kind of differentiable, or you can work with other types of functions. So this is an infinite dimensional space, which we know how to work with, and it's really kind of a space of scalar fields on R3. Um, now, my point is that even though so this kind of brings some notions of ineffability, much more ineffability to our descriptions of, uh, of what experience is. So these are kind of more ineffable experience spaces. But as we know kind of from uh, you know, centuries of physics and also observations, we can still describe lots, lots of kind of configurations, interesting configurations in the spaces. So, so we can still, Uh, describe, let's say, interesting or important um, configurations or points. So, of course, I mean, it's, we might be interested as the space of fields and some dynamics on the space of fields. So, so by that I mean, you know, so for examples, you know, if you think about like vortices or solitons, I don't have the time to go, but they're kind of, you know, if you do hydrodynamics or other kind of, uh, or quantum field theory, you'll find out that there are lots of kind of field configurations that are solutions to some differential equations. And as we know, kind of they describe, you know, like, so you can have some, you know, like a, a vortex or, or a soliton as some kind of a, a wave that behaves a bit like a particle. Um, so, and, um, and now actually these types of, uh, in some sense what I'm saying is that perhaps when you want to model experience, this is what experience is, right? So 
you know, like a feeling sad, again, you're actually feeling sad is a, is a very large kind of configuration, but feeling sad might be a certain kind of vortex in, in the space of configurations of uh, in fields. I just have, oh, okay. So I won't have much time for the second part of the talk, but so the, the point is kind of, I just want, you know, I'll just go very quickly to the second part of the talk. So in the quantum collapse model, Um, I'll just kind of say the ingredients. So the ingredients is kind of there's you know the usual wave function, um, or actually a, you know my think of it as a field, a quantum field, uh, or an element of some Fox space. And then there's another element which is an awareness field, um, which is a stochastic field. Um, and by the way, I think that actually, if you look, there's probably an equivalence between these types of, or these types of models, I think would probably very closely related to Tim's description. I mean, here, they're just done in a different way. Here, they kind of, you have the stochastic field, which, you know, will have some non-differentiable uh, kind of paths, but, and the idea is that these two things interact. Um, and you can write, the point is, what's nice about this model is that, um, you know, like Penrose told us that he has this ID, but it's not kind of, there's really no precise dynamics. So the nice, in these types of models, you have precise dynamics of how these two things interact. And kind of answering like Johannes's question about what are, you know, how do you describe our experience in these types of models? You can see that, you know, the stochastic field will have kind of very interesting kind of configurations. So which would depend on the structure, let's say, of of your brain and body. So, uh, so in this kind of awareness field, it's, this is not restricted to a certain person because I don't know what the person is. It sounds, I'm, I'm not even sure that there is such a thing as a person. I mean, this is kind of saying that there, the awareness field is really a kind of a universal field. It's something that fills space and configurations in this field would be kind of um, localized in a very precise way. Again, I don't have the time, unfortunately around maybe some type of ordered matter. This is what the kind of dynamics of this tells you. And, um, but, and this ordered matter would kind of create configurations would be some things similar to kind of like vortices or something like that, that would be what we often describe as colors or other kind of, and the point is that, but this is still kind of a global thing. So even the kind of belief in, in a self would be part of this kind of configurations. Um, but there's a lot to kind of study more and kind of try to analyze this mathematically. It's, it's quite difficult, especially with more realistic fields, which are kind of non-white noises and it becomes really difficult to, but yeah. So um, for lack of time, I'll stop here, but that's the, the model. Still three minutes. Yeah, but it would be nice to get some okay. questions. Yeah. <laughs>